Welcome back. It's Swing Pass. We've got AUDL Throws Week here going on. And Daniel and I are taking a break once again to talk about the potpourri of off-season signings. You can go to the AUDL social media, go look up the Khalif El Salam signing in the full Seattle roster, go look up DC's additions. There's a whole bunch of uh, off-season movement going on, but today, right here, we're going to be getting to the five most iconic throws in AUDL history and these are honestly just some of the most amazing plays over the course of this league's history. It's one of those things, and we always talk about this behind the scenes, throws are kind of the differentiator for our sport, right? Like, the layouts mm. are amazing. I love watching matchup defense as much as anyone, but there's something especially, there's no other way to say it, magical about the flight of a disc, right? And so today, today here, we are going to be getting into kind of the five most special versions of a throw that we've seen in the last 10 or so years of this league's history. Good stuff. Let's start it off with, we're going to go back to 2016. And we're not ranking these, by the way. We're not going in any particular order. Well, we're going in chronological order. But it's important to keep in mind that these are not rankings. We're not saying one throw is better than another. Although, if if we had to take into account, like, context plus degree of difficulty plus like aesthetically pleasingness of a throw i think this first one would probably be up there for me yeah. basically 2016 semifinals seattle is in madison taking on the radicals and this is a madison team that has been undefeated this season they have yet to lose it was kind of like a storyline of them and dallas both teams being super strong, undefeated regular seasons, presumably expected to meet potentially in the championship. Uh, and then Madison came out firing in the semifinal game. Super strong first half, one of like the most dominant semifinal first halves of Ultimate we've seen in the AUDL history. And then slowly but surely, Seattle starts chipping away at a seven goal deficit in the third quarter only to culminate at the end of the third quarter in what this sequence is just like so wild to, to relive and rewatch as many times as I have. But basically Madison's like on the goal line. What? There's like, I don't know, 10 seconds left 11. or something like that. 11 seconds when they 11 Brown, seconds. Like, the disc. I, I've, I've watched this play for probably 11 times. seconds left. Uh, basically Seattle gets the block on the goal line. Will Chen picks up the disc with basically no time left launches an 80-yard throw from end zone to end zone, and Seattle catches the goal to cut the deficit to two. The deficit would have been expanded to four had Madison converted that goal, but instead it's a two-goal lead for Madison going to the fourth quarter. The rest is history, as they say. We know uh, Seattle went on to win that game. The 20, I, I'm just like reliving that moment. I was up in the press box for that. It's still one of the best sporting moments I've ever seen live. There's just, it, words don't do justice to the amount of energy shift that happened in that moment. They really From don't. the time the disc goes up out of Andrew Brown's hands to Carnegie swatting the disc down to, okay, well, there's what, five, six seconds left. They've got to go 80 yards. That's not going to happen. Radicals have the best defense in the league at this point. It's frustrating that the Radicals aren't going to score here with such a golden opportunity at the end of the quarter to push their lead to four. But, you know, kind of kind of no harm, no foul. Andrew Brown doesn't take yeah. a lot of shots toward the end zone. We're going for kind of the cutthroat <laughs> score. Fine. Yeah. Seattle's got to pick it up, go 80 yards. That throw is the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen in the history of the AUDL, right? Like, not only... <laughs> Did he need it to go 80 yards? He had to throw through two defenders who were right there. Dave Wiseman and Kevin Brown are right on top of that throw. And somehow, Will Chen finds the mailbox slot to pump a full-body wind-up 80-yard backhand through. And as Evan Lepler is even talking about on the broadcast, he, he so rightly asks, just befuddlingly as the disc is soaring through the air, is this going to make it the full 80 yards? And I cannot tell you how accurate that was for the 3,000 plus people in that stadium. I'm sure. There wasn't a breath happening when that disc was in the air. It was just mouths open watching this thing cruise and cruise and cruise. 
and finally just settle into Matt Russell's hands. And, and then it's just pandemonium, right? Like Seattle sideline explodes. It ignites the actual comeback. The Donnie block, the, excuse me, the Donnie Clark block happens in the fourth quarter to seal the game, mm-hmm. closes out an instant classic, probably the best game ever in AUDL history. But man, just, just getting back to the degree of difficulty on that throw, right? Like, like you were saying at the beginning of this segment, the the time, the circumstances, the distance, the level of right. difficulty, like just the composure, right? To even yeah. have the form in that moment to get the disc over midfield. Like I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen wayward buzzer beater attempts over the last several years in this league, right? Somebody just pumping for the end zone, throwing 40 yards out of bounds sideways, right? Like they're trying goes a little high jinky, whatever. Like to to have the presence of mind in that moment, to have like the calmness is just right. It's wild to me. The stadium it's was confidence too. That night. He's there, he's calling for that disc like oh, immediately. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's, and it's it's basically like a like a five yard swing. So the double team gets mm-hmm. set initially, and then it's like a five yard swing. But the double team is basically there but yeah the fact that he finds this narrow narrow lane to split the double team and then like get it getting it that much power when you have guys closing in on you is just ridiculous i mean that could have like taken someone's head off had they actually like completed the double oh, team I know. If, they, if that throw like hits either brown or wiseman <laughs> in the face that's like taking out teeth like you're going to yeah. the dental exam now luckily the radicals have a long time dental sponsor so i'm sure it would have been fine but, you know, there you go. Uh, the other part about that throw, how, and you kind of just alluded to it. How about Ben Snell dumping the disc with like eight <laughs> seconds left? Like he, right. he is a yard deep in the end zone and he takes one look upfield and then he just immediately gets it to Chen, who, as you say, is just like calling for it behind him. That that kind of teammate trust in that moment to not just mm-hmm. take the yardage, to not just take some of the open field, try to get some kind of gainer in that moment. Again, just so many little things had to go right for that play to happen and every single one of them did i mean should we should we mention the ref falling down oh oh, the guy running into the ref oh the long time (laughs) conspiracy that's been brewing on all the social posts over the years someone someone's got to mention it someone had to throw it out the lagged out ref and (laughs) i think it's brian hart right that has the read on the disc and both the ref and him are tracking the disc in air and they just get their feet tangled up i mean i'll say i think brian hart had a shot on that disc and he is i think he might have 100 percent the kind of player who would have absolutely bid from a crazy distance just to try to get a piece of it but yeah. you know refs are a part of action you see yeah. it all the time in football it's a sports like, thing that happens yeah unfortunately and honestly it, and and i know i'm probably gonna get flack for this at some point I, i'm glad <laughs> the throw got completed if that if that would have gone a different way i mean i i guess it, it's too much of a Pandora's box to even say anything other than the reality of what it was, right? Because does Madison win yeah. that game? Do they go on undefeated to face undefeated Dallas? Do they dethrone Dallas right. at home in front of a sold-out crowd? Does the entire trajectory of the league over the too last much. several seasons too many what ifs in a tectonic way? I mean, th- but that's how much hinged on this throw, right? I mean, right. the the greatest momentum transfer to ever happen, period. Just from about to go up four to 80 yards later, only up by two, and the other team is just unlocked. They're just freed, right? Like, you could just feel Seattle in that moment go, this game is ours now, right? Like, it, the stakes have yeah. completely shifted. I I think it, it has to be our pick as, as the most iconic throw. We haven't even talked about the other <laughs> ones, but we'll, yeah. we'll move we're on. We're not but ranking. I, we're not ranking. Yeah, we're, and we're not ranking, one. but it's got to be my pick, yeah. All right. Well, let's move let's move up the chronology to another full field and actually a longer throw. And and one that I think is even more improbable from a technical aspect and that's the 2018 Justin Allen full field flick at the buzzer. And there's a couple of crazy little details about this one. One, there is 1 second remaining on the clock. That means <laughs> that he has to catch the pole and release it in under a second. 
I don't know many players can, that can do that, period. Like, to even be able to sort of suppose you can release the disc in that kind of timing takes a phenomenal amount of practice and discipline. He not only gets the disc off, he has the premonite, or I should say the, the instinct or the know-how to step into the throw as he's receiving it. So a lot mm-hmm. of people have critiqued him for possibly traveling online. Everything gets called a travel. But yeah. this is not a travel. He takes the extra step as he's collecting. It is one of the smartest moves I've ever seen a player make. And then he launches a flick. Now, I'm sure we all know Justin Allen, and, and we should, we should you know, color this in a bit more. Justin Allen announced his retirement after playing in this league since 2014. He started with the mm-hmm. New York Empire as a rookie, but has played his last several seasons kind of as the face of the franchise for the Carolina Flyers. He finally won a title in 2021. He's been limited by injuries the past several seasons. It didn't stop him from having a phenomenal layout Callahan in 2022, but he has announced the end of his pro career, which is unfortunate. But getting back to this kind of singular moment that he had on the field, right? I mean, this dude, his entire career has been launching flick pulls. He's one of the only players in the entire sport to try to really, at distance, throw blading huge flicks towards opposing offenses. In this moment, it is like the absolute summoning of all of that flick strength from all his historical pulls into like the greatest hang time throw I've seen from an offensive standpoint in this league's history. I mean, that sucker goes 90 yards in air. It has enough RPM where when it's coming down, it's just hovering and all other 13 players on the field are underneath the disc. And somehow, some way, it still finds its way to Goose freaking Helton at the back of the end zone, who, of course, does, like, the roller celebration freestyle. <laughs> totally apropos. Right. Anyways, I, I, I'm getting rambly at this point. But, yeah, it, just... I mean, the the run up to me is, like, the iconic part of that throw. Like, the fact that he had the the instinct to do that. And I, I think the... The fact that he fielded it from like halfway into his own end zone, and I think if no one touched that disc, it probably would have made it to like halfway into the opposing end. It's probably, it, I would think it's the farthest throw that the UDL has ever seen, non non pulls wise, right? Like this is, I can't think of any yeah. other examples. At least farthest completed throw, right? There's a Stev Bonat throw from. Uh... 2017 or 2018 where he's about five yards deep in the end zone and gets a backhand off. was it in it's like was it in montreal in, though yeah and and like he gets a little bit of shorter like a field. dump power position run up yeah they they they, uh, well, they have a slightly but, shorter field but slightly shorter fields yeah. but i i would agree with you i think as far as like airtime completion yardage yeah that, and throw's got to be up there i mean it's just ridiculous the torque he gets on that thing again it's just it goes 90 yards and it still takes another like five seconds just to descend. That thing was oh, a yeah. moonshot. Yeah. I love also like the that pile in the end zone. It really was, I think it was Mao that went up for the disc and tipped it to Goose. Like if he hadn't so, tipped I think the disc, like three players it would have been blocked. Six foot seven in that pile too. <laughs> I think Misha yeah, yeah. was in that pile. Uh, I right. Think John- Josh Zdrowski, I'm gonna mess up yeah. his last name. He used to play. It for gets Austin, over so all of them. Mick, Mick Walter was in that pile. He's a massive, mm-hmm. massive dude. Like it was just funny to see. Yeah, all those oak trees sort of just get the <laughs> tips of their finger. Like it is crazy how infinitesimal the space is between some of the fingers right. going up for that disc and the way it just almost yeah magically that super slow-mo figure. shot is awesome yeah. just Paper like watching media. everyone's face and everyone is just reaching as high as they can but but yeah that like last tip that whoever the second to last flyer was to get his hands on the disc like if he hadn't done that i think it was chase cunningham that was also like yes. right in front of goose that would have blocked it or could have even caught it but because it was tipped up it got like a little extra boost to to float to goose in the back of the pile yeah jacob mao used to always come up with those kinds of plays for the flyers and for his college and club teams i just feel like he's got that little extra special something avery johnson for madison radicals has done that for years just sort of 
right place, right time, multiple yeah, seasons in a, a row sort of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, cool. Let's uh, let's move on. Let's stick with the Flyers theme, and we'll stick with the same year, 2018. Flyers Breeze. We love a good Flyers Breeze matchup. We're going to get a bunch of them this year. This is probably week my... One. Week one game of the week. Yeah. Week one, that's right. Uh, which is coming up in, what, like six weeks away? We're very close. days, I think. We're really I think closing in on the start of the season. Today. Yeah. Yeah. We are on Man. the runway to 2023, baby. Good stuff. Well, anyway, this this was, I think this was the first Flyers Breeze game I ever watched. So I joined the mm-hmm. league in 2019, was doing a lot of research on the previous season's games, going through watching game of the weeks. This was like my favorite ever example of like a pure 1v1. It was Nethercut versus Rowan just trading blues throughout this game. But a lot of that was more in the second half. So at the end of the first half, basically the Flyers are down, I think, 12-7. At this point, and the Breeze have the disc with like just a handful of seconds left on the clock. It seems like they're going to go down, maybe take their shot at a buzzer beater. But the Flyers get a block and call a timeout with like two seconds left on the clock. And they have the disc on the near sideline. They're about 35 yards out, or I guess 25 yards out from the end zone. Jonathan Nethercutt picks up the disc coming out of the timeout. And he throws the most ridiculous throw that only he has the physical tools to throw. <laughs> Behind the back flick, it, it floats very nicely into the end zone, gets tipped. A diving Shane Sisko comes up with the disc, and the Flyers cut the lead to four. They did go on to lose the game, uh, but it was such an exciting second half. And I think that momentum from that play really sparked their ability to get themselves back in that game. I mean, it it's a singular throw from a singular kind of thrower, right? In preparation for the, this episode, we were talking about how Nethercut's throwing form is basically the most uncoachable skill in I don't ultimate. get it. I mean, we, yeah. you and I both know from playing years, you try to get your hips into it. You're really focused on that kind of knee stride out, lower body power you can generate. Nethercut... Mm-hmm. For his entire life, or for as long as I can remember at this point, he just sort of dips to his right side a little bit, or does like almost a no shimmy shimmy. Right. Where he'll just yeah. sort of like, it, it's like fainting, right? It's like boxer moves. It's like a he's, few inches of torque. That's all it takes. And then just such, like the yeah. hardest snap I've ever seen on a flick. It reminds me of a power boxer like Mike Tyson or something, right? Like he's a power thrower and they just need these little deeks, these little shimmies, these little fakes to open up these kinds of opportunities and they will just run a train through them. And you see that all the time with Nethercut on just his normal flick hooks. Last year in Colorado, right. he's just standing upright, stand still and they'll go, uh, and it's 70 yards. It's just 70 <laughs> yards out of hand on a shelf. Picture perfect. And he did that behind the back with two seconds left in a half. Like, it's one of those things where people don't even try this throw, right? Like, no, why would you? tries this throw, you're getting benched. You're not, it's not like, (laughs) nice, nice try. We're down five in a, in a big road matchup. You can't throw behind the back. And, and with this, it's, it, he does it. He completes it because of course he does. And, and to me, it's like, that was a good look. That that's that's a good end of <laughs> right. Order. Well, it, it was. Situation. I forgot to mention there was obviously a double team was set on him. So like it I mean, kind of made sense for the situation. Cut? What's a double team to Nethercut? What is well, it's because he can do him. things like that. That it's it's nothing. But yeah, like he just. It's so funny watching the the slow mo angle of like seeing both the double teamers' faces up close, and they like have their hands up, and then they just like look like like how did he what did he just do and evan doesn't even realize it evan leffler is commentating it he didn't even realize that another cut through behind the back flick because it just looked like a normal throw i yeah, don't blame him at all jones pointing it out to yeah you know, brian jones and you can see that from everyone on the field like there was just sort of this like even the marks <laughs> were just kind of like like yeah. it goes up and they just start watching it and there's just this kind of befuddleness at like oh man we let right. off a buzzer so beater really but, throw that wait a second, he didn't throw through us and he didn't step out for the backhand. So like, right. What? Like I, 
there needs to be some kind of oral history about Eric Miner and I, I forget who else was on the double team. It was uh, Houston. They're Parks not to blame the for guy. this. They're not to blame, but I need to know kind of like a, a yeah. Zapruder footage style point by point <laughs> of just what happened during this. Like, what were you thinking? Like, how long did it actually kind of take to settle in of like, he just dropped it behind the back throw on us. Like there's really not anything to defend there. Right. There's yeah. No I'm also curious. There. Do you think it was like a planned play by them coming out of the timeout? Or you think this was a, in the moment Nethercutt just wanted to get to the end zone. And that's what he decided was best. We need to get, we need to get Mike D or Nethercutt on here to really explain that. I would guess that. Situation or Jack. Really the Jack was the one that it. tipped it initially. I think. Yeah. I think it was maybe supposed to be like a hammer. I could see, you know, yeah. the other cuts got great hammers, but like, I don't know. I, I think the actual decision to do that throw was definitely <laughs> all improvised nut, right? I can't get over the fact that he got it as far as he did. Like, he doesn't pivot. There's no, like, there's no, like, significant torque he's generating. He just kind of, like, he just does it. And, like, only he has that flick strength to pull off that throw. It's, I could watch it all day. It's the kind of thing that like a guy in the quad in college has like his throw, right? Like he just, he doesn't have <laughs> yeah, anything yeah. else. He's never really played ultimate, but like he's just been perfecting like a behind the back goofy. Right, right. It's all, all they throw. practice all the time. Yeah. It's their party trick. It's a party trick throw. Well, we're just going to keep moving on from one improbable throw to the other. And actually the third throw on this list from the 2018 season, the most viral clip I think in this selection and probably in the AUDL's history, of course, I'm talking mm -hmm. about the Kyle Henke greatest. I mean, he threw a half field greatest. It's it, again, it's just sort of like <laughs> a the perfect cut throw. I don't know that there's going to be something else ever like this. And it was during, it, it was his rookie season, right? 2018 was his rookie season. Now he may like, have played. That was like his breakout like season, but he yeah, may have played yeah. before that. Yeah, I feel like he did. Him I'm and Smelly, I think, came on during 2017 in part. He did play. Yeah, yeah, he played four games in 2017. But we don't, yeah, we don't count that. I mean, and like, as well as whether it was rookie season or not, technically, the game itself didn't really matter. It was just this individual moment where Matt Bennett tries for kind of like a cross field, low release swing pass. 25 yeah. yards out into the flat and of course it it just sort of sails on him Pop a lot of passes like that do across field and texas wins and it's it's one of those things where i think because it came over hanky's head he almost doesn't have a sense to give up on it quite yet i think if he would have came at a slightly different angle at it he might have just been oh no that's out of bounds but something about the way in which it kind of, there's that moment he looks up and it he's running and it just sort of like crosses and the way in which like he can kind of vector line up to it it just feels like it activated something where he's like oh, i'll try it you know I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll try and save this and what you see so often the greatest is just sort of the whip back into bounds or or kind yeah, of trying yeah. to get it get it far but get it into the middle of the field get it into a pack this was a pass this was a 50 yard downfield to the receiver pass I mean, there are flicks in normal situations that don't have the kind of planing and velocity that this just otherwise blind save has. I mean, <laughs> you watch his body in the air. He's kind of doing like a backhand step through as he's in flight, right? Like, it, it's just, I, I don't know about you. Whenever I've tried a greatest, I look like I, I'm having a... A bit of like a muscle malfunction or stroke. Oh, I just yeah, I flail like, around. It's just yeah, it's just me trying to do five things at once. It's me <laughs> button mashing on like a controller, right? Like everything yeah. at once. And there was a. Just... Do you remember the the Pavel greatest at the end of the Minnesota game in 2019? I want to say that like super uncoordinated, <laughs> just like you know, flailing armed attempt. That's what I, I feel like most greatest attempts look like. But yeah, this also, when you think about it, I mean, you mentioned the wind. Obviously, this this disc popped up. Henke had to throw in that same wind, in that same direction. And his throw is perfect. It's, it's like an absolute dime in stride. Like the distance, the accuracy, considering he is falling through the air, has no feet planted on the ground, it's it's truly unreal. It, it is well deserving 
of being the most viral clip in the league's history. I remember, I don't know if it was immediately after it or if it was like a year later when SportsCenter slash ESPN kind of does their yearly refresher sharing of it. But I, mm-hmm. he used to be his pinned tweet for forever, but Henke tweeted out at one point, I've already kind of hit the pinnacle achievement <laughs> in my ultimate career. And I'll just say, yeah. I, I I like lamented with him in that moment. I was like, geez, he's totally right. Like, how do you top this? <laughs> He's slowly starting to, right? Oh, he's topped it. Yeah. Three yeah. Collegiate yeah. Player of the Year, like this last season, the way in which he had that second team all IUDL performance. Like, he has really elevated his play to the next level. And I'm really excited to see what 2023 and the Austin Soul will be doing after they got all of that confidence and mojo after last year beating Atlanta and Carolina. They've added in a couple of nice names in Shane Worthington from Seattle and now Tyler Reinhardt from dallas it just they feel good right now right yeah no they they really do and henke yeah i think it it could have been very much the case where he was just like a one-hit wonder and known for that play only but you're right i mean he's he's leveled up his game every single season and yeah i still don't think he's peaked because he's still super young yeah it feels like he's almost used it as a bit of motivation and not just be the highlight guy right 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 yeah all right, well, we'll move on to our final clip. This is a, a Jack Williams buzzer beater. I've lost track at this point of the amount of buzzer beaters that Jack Williams has thrown. But this one came last season, 2022 East Division Championship game against the D.C. Breeze. New York was in control a lot of this game, and then D.C. really put it together at like the end of the third quarter, into the fourth quarter. They were rallying back and really trading scores pretty consistently with New York. I believe it was Christian Boxley that had just scored the last goal for DC and New York had the disc with like, I don't know, what was it? Like 20 seconds left. They had like a decent possession, maybe 30 seconds. Like it was clear they were going to have the last possession and a decent shot at the end zone. Um, And they, you know, it's a tie game. They're progressing up fields. Of course, Jack Williams just like breaks free into the open space at the exact right time as like the clock is ticking under 10 seconds. He gets hit on the near side of the field. He's probably about, let's see, 40-ish yards out at that point. And 40 yards just... out and full cross field to get it to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And like his, his momentum is basically taking him towards the near sideline. He decides to launch it to the far sideline just puts out this such like a soft pillowy backhand and it's just like you you know because last year uh the year so in 2021 he did the same thing where he hit ryan osgar on a buzzer beater to beat atlanta and send new york to championship weekend and if he were able to complete this one it would again beat dc and then send new york to championship weekend so you just had a feeling that someone was going to come down with this throw, but still, it was just like a pile of bodies in the end zone. It initially looked like the throw might be going out of bounds. I know Jack has said that, but it curved so nicely into the front corner of the end zone. And who else but birthday boy Ben Yacht comes down with the disc and sends New York to championship weekend, which they would go on to dominate and win their second title in three seasons. I think what makes this throw so iconic for me is this sort of player moment uh, synthesis of everything. Like you were saying, you you don't know how many game-winning throws he's had. He's had four game-winning throws since joining New York in 2019. There was the 2019 regular season one where he threw it to Bo Kittredge, the first meeting mm, between the Flyers and Empire. The second one was in the Flyers and Empire rematch in the regular season in Week 10 in 2021. He had that great upline, low release Jack Williams oh, chisel Babbitt. throw to Jeff Babbitt. Third That's one, nice. the 2021 uh, Atlantic Division to go to Championship Weekend game. I still don't know what we call that round of playoffs, but when they played Atlanta, <laughs> Ryan's right. Ryan Osgar. And with this one, because there were the other three, because there's all these kind of playoff Jack moments, there was this there was this gravity right to like okay, New York's got to go to the whole field, but man, if they get Jack Williams in one of his spots, it's sort of like getting Kobe Bryant on the wing with like an opportunity to ISO a defender and hit a fadeaway, right? Like there were two defenders right there on top of Jack Williams. I think it was Alexander Fall and Rowan, right? Like they're they're there. 
They're trying yeah. to crash. Rowan, al- Rowan almost out. gets a hand on it too. Right. Rowan's I mean, close. I, it, it's good defense. It's just that yeah. thing. And I, I kind of wrote about it this week in my article. It's, it's that balance that Jack William has. You were describing it. He's kind of coming and blitzing towards the near sideline to get this throw. And as he's receiving it, he just kind of transfers all of his weight over, gets both defenders to fly by him, and then just simply pivots to his backhand and lets it go, right? Like, it, it, similar to the Will Chen throw, I think there's so much mm-hmm. underrated quality to the amount of reps it takes to get to just get the confidence to unleash that throw in that moment, right? Like, the amount of players who, like you said, wouldn't have the right touch, wouldn't get that feather softness where the disc just floats down so that the tallest player Ben Yacht can just go up and get it. Like that takes a lot. That's not just him throwing up prayers. I feel like the Osgar one right. was a bit more of a prayer. It was a bit longer, but that, that one just... also the Osgar one, everyone misread it. Like all the Atlanta guys were in the wrong spot to get that. <laughs> that was so and then Osgar was, was just like, like oh. jittery buzzer beater I've seen in some time. Yeah. I think Osgar <laughs> really caught was. it almost with both feet on the ground. But this one, yeah. this was just yacht summiting. This, this was, was Statue yeah. of yeah. Liberty play in New York, right? Like you're just throwing to the big man up top. But there's yeah. Again, it's that inevitability. Like, the second that disc got to Jack, I was like, oh, it's over. If he gets the throw off, it's over. Like, there isn't going to be overtime. This is... It's this it's is silly, though, that... It's silly, though, that we think that, right? Like, that that's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's a buzzer beater, right? It should be, like, a 50-50, but... It's in all the context around Jack Williams and the Empire, like, their downfield receivers are huge, and... Ben Yad is a two-time MVP. Like, it all made too much sense not to work, you know? Yeah. Well, and that kind of looks like New York heading into 2023, right? They just announced their third batch of four <laughs> roster signings. Yeah. Uh, Chartok, Lithiao, Rushmeyer Bailey, and uh, Weinberg, Charles Weinberg. You know, they, yeah. they're now so same fully O-line. loaded with the starting seven offense that just set the league record in offensive efficiency. There's just... Yeah, there's there's just this sense that this is what New York does. Yeah, I don't know what anyone can do about it anymore. Well, D- DC's DC's loading up. They're, they're but DC doesn't have they don't time. have the Jack Williams buzzer beater magic. They need to get their own magic. What <laughs> what is the magic about DC? Well, there's some rumors and and pulled from the uh, Johnny Malks and Rowan McDonald podcast that. Rowan might be switching over to defense this year with so much of the brought in free agent talents of Cole Jerk, Andrew Roy, Joe Merrill, and Thomas Edmonds. So maybe Rowan can supply that on defense. I mean, I, I think back to uh, the 2019 All Star game where there was that buzzer beer at the end of the third. Rowan goes mm, up huge yeah. and swats it out of Yacht's hands. Like, yeah, he looks rejuvenated. Maybe he's prepping for a season like that. I don't know. I could I could see it. I, I'd be a fan of the Rowan versus Jack matchup for DC New York games. That'd be a good one. Look, DC's got to start putting it somebody on defense. They've got like twelve offensive <laughs> starters now. They brought back all the Norbombs pretty much. They're just getting yep. the Norbomb hive mind on board. Like Garrett Braun is back this year. Like they've they've kind of combined their 2019, 2021. 20, like it's a it's an all star team of the last few seasons for DC plus all these newcomers. Yeah, they're they're going right at New York this year. I'm excited. Well, look, we're getting away from throws. We're starting to talk about more off-season news <laughs> and preparation for the opening of the 2023 season on Friday, April 28th. That is in 44 days. I know we said 45 days earlier for mm. DC versus Carolina in the game of the week, but the season starts in 44 days, I believe. So, love it. We'll be back a week from today to talk more about AUDL news and the off season. But we thank you for tuning in this week. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now.